Hello, good afternoon and welcome to this latest IFG live event on lockdown compliance and pandemic fatigue. I'm Emma Norris, Director of Research at the Institute for Government. So cast your mind all the way back to March the 23rd. That was the day when the Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced a nationwide lockdown with a simple message to the British public, stay at home. And nearly eight months in, that's where most of us still are, with England back in lockdown and restrictions of various kinds in place across the UK. People have grown used to these rules, from bans on gatherings and closed pubs to orders to self-isolate and mandatory mask wearing. But are people now growing tired of them and crucially tired of having to comply with these rules? And if the restrictions and rules put in place to stop the spread of COVID-19 are now causing a rise in pandemic fatigue, then how should policymakers and politicians respond? To discuss compliance and explore what needs to be done to keep the public on board with the rules designed to stop the spread of this highly contagious disease, I'm joined by our world beating panel, Chris Cook, uh, contributing editor at Tortoise, and John, professor in public health and psychiatry at Swansea University and chair of the National Advisory Group to the Welsh Government and a member of SPY-B, which provides behavioural science advice to SAGE. Stephen Riker, Professor of Social Psychology at the University of St Andrews and also a member of SPY-B. And last but not least, Anthony Yates, a former Professor of Economics at the University of Birmingham. So we're going to start the event today with opening remarks from each of our panellists. Then we'll have some discussion amongst the panel before opening up to questions sent in by the audience. So if you're watching at home, please do start sending in questions as soon as you have them. You can do that via the Q&A function and um, that you should be able to see on screen. And I'll try and get through as many of your questions as possible by the end of the event. And the event's on the record and there's going to be a recording available afterwards. It'll go up on our website as soon as possible. And um, so we've only got an hour. So without further ado, let's get going. And um, Stephen, I'm going to come to you first. We're being told that the next two weeks are crucial for ending lockdown and that the Prime Minister's clearly looking ahead to Christmas and what he can do there. That puts pressure on the government to get compliance right and means they really need to know what the public are doing. So do we know whether people are less compliant now than in the early stages of the pandemic? And what might be driving any change in people's willingness to comply with the rules? I was going to start by saying the only way in which the UK has been world beating to date has been in getting it wrong and being worse than virtually anybody else. But I suppose if you get everything wrong, you're very good as a counterexample for everybody else in the world. Um, Compliance. I think we get compliance wrong in three ways. I mean, first of all, when you look at levels of compliance, actually, by and large, they are pretty good. This not only comes from self-report data, but systematic observations of behaviour. So things like mask wearing, distancing are up around um, 80, 90 uh, percent. They're pretty good. Um, we, uh, our media and media generally um, uh, like a, uh, a bad news story. Of course, a, a spectacular violation, uh, a big house party is far more uh, newsworthy than people sitting quietly at home. And so we tend to overestimate uh, the levels of non-compliance. Uh, and I think that can be dangerous because I think it can set negative norms. You know, if everybody else isn't complying, uh, we shouldn't comply. As I say, on the whole, compliance is pretty good. There are some areas, however, where it's very poor. And the obvious example is self-isolation, where depending on the figures you look at, it's as low as about 11%. Um, and what that suggests is this is not necessarily a matter of motivation. It's an issue of practicality because self-isolating is very difficult. You might lose your job. You might lose money. How do you do it if you live in a crowded house? What do you do about your caring responsibilities and so on and so forth? So uh, as I say, the, the exception to the relatively good news um, uh, points to where the problem is. Second point is, but when it comes to violations, again, I think we misunderstand the nature of those violations. Uh, politicians, Boris Johnson amongst them, uh, commonly talks about brazen violations and people flouting uh, the rules. And again, um, you know, the headline of the House Party uh, is more spectacular than a headline of you know, going for a walk with one too many people or having one too many people around for a dinner party unless that person is Jeremy Corbyn, and then it gets headlines. But nonetheless, the, the, the suggestion that is given is that they are spectacular violations. And the danger with that is it leads people to think, well, you know, the problem is elsewhere. Uh, it's not self-relevant. And my 
interpretation of the rules and my slight bending of the rules isn't a problem. And actually, the evidence does suggest that the major problem is a lot of people uh, doing a little bit more than they should do or, or, or having too much social contact rather than a few people having a vast uh, amount of contact. I was at a meeting with the Scottish police where they've been to 440 house gatherings, only uh, 13, less than 2% were more than 15 people. And when they knocked on the doors of everybody else, they said, why are you knocking on our doors? We're not having parties. So again, I think we misunderstand the nature of the violations. And the third point, which is why I so dislike the term uh, fatigue, is I think we, we misrepresent the nature of the problem. Um, there's always been a notion and a paternalist notion and an elitist notion that, uh, you know, the masses, the people are psychologically weak and they need to be guided by their, by, you know, by their betters, by, polit by politicians. That, that notion of mass society has been there since the 19th century. It's still there psychologically. We saw it at the beginning of the pandemic through the notion of behavioural fatigue. And what happened was very different. Actually, we showed remarkable resilience, not because individually people uh, were particularly resilient, but because they came together collectively. So resilience was something that happened between us when we supported each other. And what's changed uh, since the first lockdown, I think, is not a change within people. It's not that people have become psychologically weaker. It's a change between us and the government. It's a loss of trust. So early on in the pandemic, levels of trust in England were about 75%. Uh, they've fallen to about 30%. They fall, fell most calamitously in the week after Dominic Cummings uh, went to Barnard Castle and was defended by Boris Johnson. So there is a loss of trust. And I think that left loss of trust is the problem. And it's a loss of trust in two ways. It's a loss of trust that what we're being asked to do makes sense and is affected. And again, a lot of evidence has come out recently that people will put up with restrictions if they think they are effective, but not if they don't. And so paradoxically, actually, stricter restrictions, if they're seen as being effective, may uh, get more compliance than lesser restrictions, which people feel have been shown uh, to fa fail. And the second loss of trust is a, a loss of trust in uh, what the government is going to do with our behaviours. And that's particularly important in terms of the testing system. Um, fears that, uh, you know, if we get in relationship to the testing system, how will our information be used? Will it be used against us? Uh, and so trust is particularly important in relationship to behaviours of that sort and will be particularly important in terms of the vaccine. So the issue of trust and the need to restore the bond of trust, and I don't have time to go into that in detail, but I think it does depend upon a pivot from that paternalism, which doesn't trust the public, to a partnership approach where you support the public and then in return uh, are in a better position to ask the public to support you. That shift from paternalism to partnership, I think, is critical to restore the bond of trust. And I think the bond of trust, which we've to a certain extent lost, um, is going to become more important, especially when it comes to taking vaccines. So we've heard about a reset from the government. We've heard, heard about a reset from Boris Johnson. I think probably one of the most important resets they've got to do is to restore that partnership and that bond of trust. And that's where the problem lies, not in the fragility of human psychology. Stephen, thank you so much. That was an absolutely fascinating um, opening and lots that I want to pick up on, particularly the question of how to restore trust. Um, Anne, I want to come to you next. Uh, Stephen talked about the phrase pandemic fatigue and that um, he doesn't find it a particularly helpful phrase. It's, some, it's a phrase we've heard a lot in the last six months. Um, what's your take? Is pandemic fatigue real? Is it a useful phrase? Are we seeing it now? And what is the role of government in helping people play by the rules? So I guess Stephen has outlined many of the reasons why the, the things driving people's behaviours are not necessarily to do with pandemic fatigue. So we're not seeing a lot of evidence that exists. People's intention to um, do the behaviours that we want them to do with, with you know, social isolation and physical distancing are quite high and remain high. And I guess the, the issue with a phrase like pandemic fatigue is, is that it's sort of attractive, isn't it? We've been living in this in, with the pandemic for a long time. 
the idea that people might adapt and get a bit bored and their motivation may drop, that's quite a good sort of catchphrase for actually the drivers that we're seeing, which are to do with trust, are to do with practical interventions to support people to undertake these behaviours. So that's why I think, so that's on the one hand why I think it's unhelpful. What, you know, that one reason is basically because that's, it, it's sort of a cover for actually much more pertinent underlying issues. And then the second problem with it is that it really, um, once the idea is out there, it can create a norm. You know, this is what's happening. We're, we're all undergoing pandemic fatigue and it almost feeds itself. So that's why, although I think um, some of the underlying concepts that pandemic fatigue might make us think about um, are useful, the concept itself isn't helpful at all in our current situation. I guess going forward, thinking about um, some of the other issues you, you raised is, you know, we hear a lot about certain groups that may not be adhering to um, advice or behavioural um, actions. And, you know, they particularly tend to focus on, on males, younger age groups, those from lower socioeconomic positions, people who are working. And in many ways, those groups are the ones who've been disproportionately affected by the pandemic. So, they're the people, one, who are much more likely to experience the financial consequences of what we're asking them to do. They're the people who are going to be much more worried about an economic downturn and the consequences for their lives. And then if you look at, um, you know, studies, there are lots of, of surveys that have been done with people, but there are also very well designed studies. And they all point to the fact that the impact on people's mental health and well-being is being disproportionately experienced across our population. And, you know, funnily enough, those groups that I just highlighted, so young people, uh, people from more deprived backgrounds, it's their mental health that's being disproportionately affected. And those things have a huge impact on people's you know, motivations, opportunities and abilities to um, adhere to the behaviours that we want them to. It also means that if they are trying to, you know, address, you know, have self-efficacy, some of those issues to do with loneliness, to do with their mental health and well-being, the things they need to do aren't really about isolation. So, you know, very much as a nation, we need to be thinking very clearly about supporting and enabling people to make those choices. And though that involves real tangible things like financial help. It involves some less tangible things like cultural change. So if you're in insecure employment or zero and have a zero hour contract, you know, while there may be financial supports in place, there may be sickness ben benefits, the actual, um, the underlying messages in a workplace may well be don't, don't go off because that impacts everyone and your employment is insecure. Equally, we need to have, you know, we need to make sure, we need to, encourage people to make plans about how they'll self-isolate and make those plans in advance so things feel clearer for them, but also support them in those practical things. So we know that many of the reasons why, why people might break that one or two times being in self-isolation are things are practical things like food shopping, going to the pharmacy, caring responsibilities. So we need to have those supports in place for people very tangibly you know not expecting it all to be sorted out by the individual themselves and then we also i think i think the other two things that we we really proactively need to do is one have support for people's emotional well-being 
and their mental health. Now that stretches from, from easy access to online support uh, and, and tools for people to, to, to manage those issues themselves through to people with higher needs. And we know that, you know, young people from more deprived communities, people with young children are experiencing this disproportionately, that, that we have access to services in place, access to helplines and proper clear pathways for those in uh, more severe distress. So I think those are the really important things. And then you combine that with clear, transparent, fair messaging about what needs to happen. And, and also, you know, I guess that thing, going back to the paternalistic thing that Stephen was talking about, you know, I think people are more than capable of understanding that our situation is constantly evolving in terms of, of the numbers of cases that the evidence is constantly evolving. So sometimes the advice will change, but those fundamental clear behaviours that we want about isolation and physical distancing, they remain the same. We need to be really clear in communicating them. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, Chris, I'm going to come to you next. Anne's just talked about the importance of clear messaging. And Stephen was talking about um, trust and the idea that people won't put up with ineffective restrictions or restrictions that they think are ineffective. Before the latest lockdown, we spent weeks, in some cases, in some areas, months in the tiers system, which has been much criticised on both of those fronts, effectiveness and um, clarity of messaging. What does that period um, prior to this lockdown tell us about the public mindset? How did it affect it? Um, and what have ministers got right and got wrong when it comes to keeping people on board? So at Tortoise, we've, we've had access to a fairly remarkable data set, which is basically using um, outgoings from people's bank accounts. So we can see where the money is going. We can see the shops where money's being spent. And it's actually quite useful as a way of understanding both the, um, the local economic impacts of lockdown and understanding and giving us a sort of bit of insight into, into economic adaptation under, in, uh, under lockdown and severity of lockdown. So um, especially if you combine it with some of the stuff that's been used more broadly, like the Google mobility data. One of the things that's very striking from the first period of lockdown is um, the severity and evenness of the of the, you know, the economic shock um, as you know, there was widespread and broad compliance. Um, you could see it in the in the first two weeks, you know, non grocery shopping dropped by about two thirds the amounts being spent. Um, we you know, a large portion of the workforce, actually in some cases unnecessarily, we think now, um, stayed at home. The, um, there are people we actually wanted to go to work who weren't going to work. Um, and the, the, the picture you sort of pull out from that is this enormous thump followed by a sort of an adaptation as we work out collectively as a society what the things we need to um, uh, save are and what the things we need, you know, what things we can safely keep doing are. Um, and actually, the it's sort of a good news story in a sense, right? You, we, we we work out how to safely do a lot of tasks that we didn't know how to do, say, at the beginning of March. We knew how to do by the beginning of May. Even when restrictions weren't being released, people were figuring out stuff. One of the problems we've got is that there are, that looking at those aggregates, hides enormous variation within towns. And one of the things that is really difficult to sort of pick through is um, if you run a hairdresser, your experience of lockdown is very different to the grocery shop next door. And the the incentive, your buy-in to this process, um, is going to be much harder to get because you are someone who's had a much bigger economic problem to overcome. And I think we when we, we talk about categories of, of employment, and actually we need to talk a lot more about sectors of employment too. We talk about... Um, um, tourism a lot and restaurateurs and things like that but actually we don't and the arts we don't talk enough about the kinds of high street shops that haven't been able to survive very well we also don't talk very much about towns so one of the the, the we think the hardest hit town in the whole country is peterborough right there's no particular reason it just so happens to have a confluence of of local industries notably distribution and retail that have made it particularly vulnerable and it's not been able to recover in the way that other places have so one of our conversations has to be, if we're going to be smart about this, how is it we support places like Peterborough? Because national policy of Peterborough probably has to be different 
to you know places that have done quite well. Yeovil, for example, has done quite well. Um, when we moved out of the initial lockdown phase, one of the things we could spot was um, there really was quite differential um, uh, experiences of the um, of the post lockdown period and the and the, the various tier systems. So when we moved, when Leicester went into its local lockdown, which was a full bore, full blown shut down everything, including the schools, even for a period, the the thump is more or less the same as it had been in the springs. Like the, you can see compliance. If you look though at Manchester, which had a the Greater Manchester period, uh, which had a long period of sort of tier two partial lockdown, um, you can't really see it. It doesn't really show up in any of the data. Not in the mobility data, not in the spending data. If you look at Bolton, which actually had, which went to tier two and a half, so they closed their pubs and restaurants to conventional service. Um, even then, you can't really spot a lot of suppression. And I think it speaks partly to the fact that there was, it was just difficult for quite a long period to find out what your local restrictions were. It was difficult to communicate it to you. If you were, it's not clear to, it's not just a failure of of, um, of government, it's also a failure of, I think, of the B, my former colleagues at the BBC, who's one of whose key roles is communicating this sort of information. Um, but it really doesn't look like the, the interstitial period between lockdown one and lockdown two, like we found a good way, except in Leicester, to get the message out about what people were doing. You really can't tell anything is happening in Manchester or even Bolton from just looking at the the data. I should be clear, that doesn't mean they couldn't tell on the ground. And for example, if you run a pub in Bolton, you know, you can still you can still feel it. But the um, and maybe there's a good way of saying this, which is that people in Bolton managed to make a living, even despite all these these, you know, these strictures. So maybe it's a good news story. But my hunch is it's a distributional story that there are a large number of businesses in Bolton that have lost a large amount of money and people are still spending. They're just spending at the other places. Um, but we don't talk enough about these distributional questions and these sectoral, these sectoral issues. Ministers, I think, have to take a lot of responsibility for the, for the failure of these intermediate um, uh, regulations, these sort of the non full lockdown uh, regulations. But and I think you have to uh, be clear that a lot of it is about uncertainty. It's about, I think, as Stephen said, one of the things that's always been striking to me is I don't know what the end goal of the lockdown is, for example, at the moment. I don't know what the aim to which me and my community are working towards, right? So, so I wonder if we could, to borrow a term from central banking, we should issue some forward guidance, right? So the uh, some 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 condition contingent um, uh, rules and regulations that say so long as X is above Y, these conditions apply. So long as Y is above Z, these conditions apply. And that's not really calling for a sort of hard and fast mathematical barriers. What we're saying is, while we're worried about your local areas A and E, we're going to have these things. When things are a bit cooler, we'll have these strictures. And when things are a bit cooler, we'll have these strictures. Just so, as Stephen says, we can feel the collective endeavour. We understand why we're being asked to do these things. I think one of the problems we had in that intervening period in the middle was why was it Manchester? Why was it Liverpool? It was never properly articulated. And until it was, I think it's it's not unreasonable for people to question why they're being asked to do this. Thanks very much, Chris. And I want to come back to some of those questions about what can government do around, for instance, forward guidance um, in discussion. Tony, I'm going to come to you. And um, last but not least, uh, it would be good to talk a little bit about how government can keep people on board. And um, it would also be useful to talk about whether we've got the right economic measures um, in place, if they helped or hindered keeping on the, the public on board so far, um, for instance, uh, the right financial support measures in place. Um, Tony, over to you. Thanks very much, Emma. Um, in my, my, my remarks are going to echo, echo um, many of the things that the other panellists have said, um, but probably in language of an economics textbook, which may be helpful or may not be helpful. Um, so in beginning with the point that, you know, just like any rules um, that we are meant to adhere to in society, uh, the lockdown rules, uh, compliance with them relies fundamentally on uh, voluntarism. You know, we, if we all collectively decided um, we didn't want to comply, there's nothing really the government or the authorities could do about it. There, there aren't the resources uh, to enforce them in the face of you know mass opposition. Um, 
that's you know why you why you see revolutions from um, time to time, for example. So what we think about the measures matters re really crucially. It's not a it's not a thing that's nice to have that that we think they're the, they're right and fair and all the rest of it. It's absolutely crucial. Um, in in this respect, one thing that's particularly difficult is the externality that is confronted um, by you know the pandemic or the pandemic confronts us with what economists call an externality. So my um, incentives to comply or not comply don't match up with um, what society wants from me as a whole. Uh, whether I comply or not will make no material difference to the societal outcome for the, epi um, the epidemic. And so, um, you know, we need to find a way of getting me uh, or, you know, anyone to buy into the collective endeavor uh, to, to get me to join in. Um, you know, one of the most obvious ways to do that is to pay me to do it. And in that respect, um, you know, policy has failed. Uh, you know, it's not not failed completely, but there are you know many pointed failures. You know, notably, for example, the miserly statutory sick pay. You know, so we we ought to be not only uh, making sure people don't feel a sacrifice for uh, self isolating, but they, in some ways they feel a benefit from joining in. Uh, the collective endeavour of um, of locking down and suppressing the virus. Um, you know, also relevant, uh, you know, to, to getting me to join in is convincing me, as um, I think both Stephen and Chris pointed out, is to convince me that it's a success and that it, that there is a logical coherence to the policy. So um, just digging into that a bit, the the. The classic thing to, to think about lockdown policies is that whilst in the short run it may appear that there is an economic sacrifice being made to suppress the virus, in the long run if the lockdown is ex executed well and we move to uh, effective test and trace and then transit uh, slowly towards uh, you know increasing numbers of people being vaccinated as that now that now seems uh, to be an imminent prospect. Um, uh, so whilst in the short run therefore there's a sacrifice in the long run there isn't if, if policy is done well so if I, if I uh, as an individual don't understand that that short run trade-off is only in the short run you know I may well not be prepared to, to join into it and in that respect it's unhelpful if it seems to be the case that either the government or a, 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 a faction in the Conservative Party for example doesn't accept um, the lack of a long run trade off uh, and, and seems to behave as though it is a matter of choosing between uh, lives saved and uh, an economic harm. Uh, so if that, if that view permeates, then you're not, you know, I'm much less likely to comply, I think, than, than otherwise. Um, the, the other thing that's relevant there is that uh, whilst in the long run, you know, we can have uh, more lives saved and a better economy. Uh, that requires that policy is executed well, and so there there are several cases in which it hasn't been. You know, Chris has outlined some of them. The sort of failure to uh, for there to be a an evident rationale in when lockdown policies are switched on and off, in particular uh, either over time or in particular regions. Uh, 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 we could point to are the you know, subsidising of uh, eating out over the summer, you know, so actually subsidising something that we know to be a risky activity that's contributing to the virus. Um, the, the highly off on nature of the lockdown policies, all of these things contribute to the sense that, you know, maybe the lockdown can't be executed competently and maybe that long run nirvana isn't obtainable, in which case why, why should we all uh, bother complying with it? Um, before I stop, the final thing I wanted to uh, point out that is difficult about lockdowns is that there is an inevitable unfairness and in inconsistency about some of the micro regulations. So the mechanics of the virus mean that there is essentially at any point in time a fixed desired budget for you could think of uh, for the amount of risky contacts uh, that can go on in the economy and those have to be allocated somehow. They could be allocated by minimizing economic harm or they could be allocated to those who most need to carry them out or who are most deserving of of getting them. Um, but it's perfectly possible that that risky budget uh, is small enough that only some ca 
can't, only some activities that seem to be apparently similar can can be permitted. And so there's an unending dialogue. Of, well, if I can do this, uh, why why is it that that is not permitted? And that's an inevitable feature of even fairly sound and um, reasonable lockdown policy, and something that the government has been struggling with, and, and all of us individually have, you know, in in our chatting about these regulations. I think I'll stop there. I've used up the time. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, so something that I think every panellist has highlighted is that falling public trust isn't really down to fatigue. There have been communications mistakes and strategy mistakes, personal mistakes. Some of the support mechanisms that are in place aren't as effective as they might be. Some policies haven't been executed particularly effectively. What do each of the panellists think have been the most damaging? What's, what's the most problematic thing that has happened um, over the last couple of months in terms of public trust? And therefore, what should gov be government's number one priority in terms of building or rebuilding trust over the next few months? Um, and I'm, uh, Stephen, um, do you want to jump in or? Tony, you've got your hand up. Why don't okay. you jump in first? Um, OK, well, I'll give it a recent example, which is the, um, the decision initially to uh, decline Sage's invitation after the 21st of September meeting to introduce another lack lockdown um, on the grounds that it would be too costly. So that, that was an example where we seem to see the government seemed to be resubscribing to the idea that there was a short run trade off between there was a there was a trade off between uh, uh, lives and uh, economic harm. And then subsequently, of course, um, going back on that decision, which is highly perverse because you know the longer it waited, the more costly the lockdown was going to be to achieve the same objective. So if it was if they thought it was uh, too costly initially, they should have definitely thought it was too costly, uh, you know, five, six weeks later. So that debate uh, happening also in private, you know, the economic analysis happening in private and separate from the epidemiological advice, I think uh, was a big setback. Chris. So I think there's been, as Stephen pointed out, the, the, the initial Dominic Cummings stuff was obviously very harmful. Um, I, I have a severely disabled family member who I've had literally two conversations with in my whole life about current affairs. The first of which was, who is this Dominic Cummings man and how do I get him fired? And the second one was jubilation last week that he'd, he'd finally gone. It's a, the, I, I raised this because the, the extent to which it spoke deeply to people as a, you know, the, this family member who wasn't able to see her mum, um, was you know and this guy got to drive all the way to durham to see his mum um was i think the extent to which this was felt um and felt deeply as stephen says shows up in the polling but i also think we're we've kind of the the manchester stuff with it andy burnham also had the capacity to be a disaster so if we've been really persisting with that tier two status for manchester for more than the very brief period it was um the sorry tier three status i should say um the would people in Manchester have seriously believed that there was a problem in the city that needed to be solved while the government was saying, um, yes, your hospitals are about to collapse. And the city itself was saying everything's actually OK. We're not totally convinced about this. Maybe things are all right. So the, the sense of common endeavour um, was completely destroyed by the fact that we didn't build a consensus between the um, between the city and and central government there's also i think part of the i've mentioned when i was speaking before about the, the lack of a sense of end goal for these for these lockdowns so i don't know what i'm working towards is a real problem in terms of my personal motivation and i do think that part of the issue with the the thing that the the, the line that links the burnham stuff and that is actually i do think the central government is really nervous about ever tying its hands about some of these decisions they're so worried about making mistakes they won't level with us about what they're actually trying to do with some of these things because they worry they'll need to change course later. The fact that this has been combined, obviously, with a series of U-turns I means it's a slightly bizarre, incoherent um, process. But I think this all does tie together. The, the, the unwillingness to cede to Manchester that they needed to put forward a coherent argument and a failure to put forward a national coherent argument are, I think, two sides of the same coin. Thanks, Chris. Um, Anne, did you want to come in? I guess going back to the Cummings incident, it's it's not it, 
it also played into that idea, you know, if people, people are experiencing both the financial and the mental health uh, adversity disproportionately, what that highlighted was that there's one rule for some people and there's another rule for other people. And that would have hugely played into issues of trust. I think the U-turn narrative was very damaging. And, you know, in many ways, some of them weren't U-turns. They were basically responses to changes in evidence and infection rates. And I think we could do much better in communicating that. And then I guess all the issues with data breaches and then all the smoke and mirrors around how contracts were for various things were handed out. I do think that those things need to be addressed in a really upfront way because, you know, if we're, if we're saying that it's trust that's driving people's experiences and behaviours, we need, we need to rebuild that properly. Thank you. And Stephen, um, so what's the priority for government in the in the weeks to come? And what's the number one thing they can do to rebuild um, public trust? Well, I want to start from what Anne said, because I completely agree with her. The, the reason why Cummings was so corrosive was precisely that it led to a sense of one law for them and another for us. It, and all, you know, uh, the uh, uh, talking to people, that, that was the first phrase they'd come up with. And it points to all the literature on compliance with authority, of the procedural justice literature, which says trust derives from a sense that the government is of us and for us. Um, and distrust comes when you start thinking of government as them and as other. And I think the whole approach of the government has actually, and its paternalism, has been to position the public as the other. So its argument goes basically, start by individualising compliance, implying that if you don't uh, comply, you've chosen not to do so. It then blames the public and tells the public up off when uh, infections go up. And then it responds to non-compliance through threats of punishment. And each of those things is othering the public in various ways. Now, we know you get infected by exposure. Okay? And the reason why you get exposed is in large part due to your circumstances. If you have to uh, be in public facing jobs, if you have to go on public transport, if you're in crowded housing. Right? And therefore, the most deprived groups are going to be the most exposed, which is why they're the most uh, infected. The response then should not be to blame people who are infected, but to support them. If the government started from saying not, look, you're wrong or they'll wag your finger at you, but what are the um, uh, limits upon compliance? And how can we help you? If you need to self-isolate, how do we help you? If you have problems and you have to go home uh, as a pupil, how do we give you the IT and how do we give you the books? I mean, in every single area, if they started from support, then they would prove themselves to be acting for the public, not against the public. Um, they would be seen to be of us and for us, and you begin to change trust. So the government must stop its narrative of blame, stop wagging its finger, at us, stop telling us what to do, attend to what it should be doing to support us, and then you might not only make it possible practically for people to comply, but create the motivations and the trust through which people are motivated to apply. So there has to be a U-turn in that relationship with the public. The public's got to be seen as the partner in this, not the problem that's got to be managed, blamed, and punished. Thanks, Stephen. Um, I also want to ask about the tier system. We talked a lot about trust. Um, the tier system called all sorts of issues on this front, um, particularly around the respective treatment of the North versus the South. Yet we're hearing that one of the most likely outcomes post 2nd of December is the reintroduction of the tier system. What needs to change if that system is going to be successfully reintroduced this time? Who wants to jump in first? Well, again, can I say right at the start, and Spy B in fact wrote a paper on this, ignored like many of the papers that uh, uh, that we wrote I, 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 and I don't know whether you sometimes feel what's the point I, I, I occasionally do and and it made the point that the whole notion of lockdown was misconceived because lockdown is punitive lockdown is what you do in prison lockdown is what you do if somebody's done something wrong if you reconceptualized it as we are dealing with areas which are deprived that's why they have more infections 
And of course, you look at the data, and one of the key factors in what is lockdown is deprivation. So you start off by thinking, okay, how do we support people? How do we support people with information? How do we support people with testing facilities and decent uh, tracing? How do we support people with the resources they need to put up with the restrictions uh, we need to give them? If things were framed in terms of support, then the noxious nature of, of, of lockdown, not both because it stigmatizes and because it punishes economically, we wouldn't have these self-same problems. So the first thing I would say is stop thinking in terms of lockdown. It's still tied into this punitive attitude that the public is doing something wrong. Start from a narrative of support and things will play out in very different ways. Thank you. Anybody else? Go ahead, Anne. I was going to say, couldn't agree more with that. I think we should just even just move away from the language and talk about staying at home and responding to local rates. You know, there's a lot of um, community and city and area identification that we can work with, that you're helping the people in your community that are closest to you. And we don't make enough of that. And I think what's really important about the whole circuit breaks or fire breaks as we call them in, in uh, Wales is to communicate the real rationale for why we go between different measures and I don't think we've done that well enough and it, it can't just be about going well if it's you know over 50 per 100,000 those, those numbers are difficult to communicate but they can be communicated so so I think there's a really important piece of work where we work with communities and people to communicate what those circuit breaks and fire breaks mean what are the rationales behind them because because they're understandable thank you tony you wanted to jump in thank you yes thank you um i wanted to um echo uh what anna and uh, Stephen have just said really which is if we were to return to um, a regional, a potentially regionally differentiated system like the tiering system was, there is a really big benefit to doing so, which is that, um, you know, while one region locks itself down, suppresses the virus, the rest of us can get, get on producing things and working. Um, but uh, there has to be a way found to make the region that is locking down. I'm sorry to use, keep using that uh, unpleasant term just for brevity. I don't. I, I agree. I, I don't subscribe to it. But uh, you, there has to be a way for that region to feel the benefit of the rest of us working. So it's not really just a question of compensating them for their own income loss. They have to feel the collective benefit that the rest of us are doing by live, not only producing but you know enjoying our freedoms and that that really wasn't uh, achieved in the previous time I, and I suspect it won't be next time but and it, this is not just a question of social justice it's a you know it's a question of economic efficiency and you know don't, you don't need to um, have a kind of bleeding heart um, uh, attitude to it which I happen to have it, it's a, a question of hard economic efficiency that that, that should be the case. Thank you. Um, I want to move on to some audience questions now, just because uh, we're already running short of time. One of the things that we focus less on is enforcement and the balance between compliance and enforcement. And one of the questions we have is what, what should that balance be? And what's, what should the kind of correct role of the police be during the pandemic? Stephen. So actually, I think it hasn't been perfect. And there have been real issues, for instance, in terms of ethnicity and greater fines given to ethnic minorities. But nonetheless, I think overall the policing has been very good. The policing has been based on principles of procedural justice, precisely the point that the police are effective to the extent that they are seen as of and for the community rather than against the community. So how do you achieve that? Well, um, the procedural justice literature says you achieve that by treating people with respect, listening to people, having dialogue. And that's reflected. So go to the College of Policing website and you will see their piece on the four E's where they talk about engaging, explaining, encouraging, and only long after enforcement. Enforcement is a failure. 
And the point about a law is a law fails if it doesn't have consent and has to be enforced. A good law is a law that expresses a social norm and communicates it very strongly so that people understand it's the right thing to do. If you look with masks, for instance, mask wearing was 20 percent. We repeatedly said to people, wear masks, wear masks, didn't change at all. Partly because people said, well, if it's that important, why is it voluntary? It was made compulsory, right? And within two weeks, the compliance rates went up to over 80% and they stayed really high. And the same is going on at the moment in, in Scotland today. In fact, travel um, is being prohibited. And again, the police have said, we're not gonna set up roadblocks. It's not about enforcement. The issue isn't to enforce it. The issue is to let people understand why this is so important. Of course, if there are egregious uh, violations, we'll do something about it. But that will be a failure. And when you look at the countries which have gone in for really harsh um, uh, enforcement, especially on regulations which are seen as inequitable because certain people can't go along with them, it's led to disorder and it's led to riot and it's fundamentally divided the country and undermined uh, the uh, the response. So I think all these debates would say, how are we going to force it? We've got to enforce it. Miss the point. We've got to in implement the law in a way that you don't have to enforce, because if you enforce it, you fail and you create even greater problems. So distinguish making something uh, a legal uh, mandatory on a legal level from the issue of the enforcement. They're two very separate things. Thank you, Chris. So I, so I would agree entirely with Stephen on all of that. I think there's a separate thing, which is that the United Kingdom is quite unusual in the weakness of the capacity of central government to actually enforce as well. Right. So actually, the our ability to be draconian is actually pretty limited because we have a fairly thinly stretched um, enforcement capacity compared to lots of other states. I think it's worth thinking about the one of the things that's that people in sort of Hong Kong and Japan and Taiwan places have, have sort of have raised is so we there are lots of British people who wince at the invasion of privacy of the state um, that that actually not Japan but the those other states have have, uh, have engaged in particularly South Korea and it's you know it's no surprise that those are those are states that um, that have very very high readiness for invasion they're continuously looking for defection as a sort of security problem they have a standing capacity to enforce and monitor that, that we lack. Um, but there's a good question about whether they, the trade-off they've made is they haven't had a lot of these sort of town or city-wide um, processes. What they've had instead is very individualized um, quarantining and you know, other rules. So the, the rather than mass rules, they've had a lot more, if your number comes up on the app and you get pinged, your life gets really bad, but for everyone else, it's a bit more bit more uh, measured and actually one of the conversations we haven't had in this country is about whether we've got that that balance of, of regulation and and voluntarism right when it comes to basically test and trace rather than rather than lockdown I'd also say there's one one area where I think we we're going to whether there's going to be a long-term problem is actually in schooling where it looks like there is a there, it's not a lot of people, but there is a persistent rise in homeschooling at the moment, which is a thing you're allowed to do. And it's very much a, a you know, it's a thing that we see as a guarantee of your right to raise your children in your faith, basically, is the, it, that's what it exists for. Um, but it's being used by lots of people who are very worried about sending their children to a school who are going to come back with the virus and then maybe, you know, kill an elderly family member. And one of the things we're going to have to sort of to to enforce properly in the next few years is getting those children back into regular education that should be seen as a public policy ambition um enforcing that has been basically impossible for 10 years so 15 years since we started worrying about it in lots of some um some ethnic minority communities um as a sort of systematic problem that's an area where i'm worried about enforcement because basically we've not managed it to date and it's just got a lot worse Thank you. Anne. So just two things really. So one, to, I absolutely agree with Stephen, you know, enforcement is the end game of engagement, understanding legislation. But I, I just wanted to highlight how enforcement plays to all the inequalities and disproportionate experiences in the same groups. You know, so enforcement tends to be in those from deprived communities, 
young people and people from BAME backgrounds. So all the issues we've talked about in this panel will, will become wider and trust will be hugely impacted. So, so you know, not a great fan of enforcement. Um, however, I do think the police have been very balanced for the most part. The second thing was was to talk about schooling. And I think one of the one of the sort of issues to unpick there is that although most of the evidence is pointing to young people, particularly older adolescents and young adults, um, their mental health being disproportionately affected compared to older adults. Within that, when you look at school aged children, that there's some quite mixed results. So, you know, kids who were previously very anxious in school, who experienced a lot of uh, emotional pressures through academia and relationships in school, they've actually benefited in some ways from not being so exposed. And I think some of that drive of, of homeschooling and stuff may come from things like that. There's going to be a, have to be a whole rebalancing of how, how we run our system after this. Thank you. I've got quite a few questions um, on devolved governments. Um, we've already we've seen uh, recently quite a lot of divergence. England's currently in lockdown. Wales chose to pursue the kind of firebreak approach. Have some devolved governments handled compliance more effectively than the national government? Stephen? Yes. <laughs> do you want me to say more? Please um, do. I mean, again, it, it, it's not perfect, right? And, and there have been serious missteps along the way. But in Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon talked very clearly about um, a, a, an adult dialogue respecting the public at a time when Boris Johnson and the Michael Gove were blaming students and young people, Nicola Sturgeon said very clearly, she said, the reason why young people are getting infected is because young people are much more likely to be in public facing jobs, to go on public transport and to be in multi-occupancy flats. It's not their fault, okay? Um, when you look at the trust figures in England, uh, for the UK government, it's 30%. In Scotland, it's over 70%. Now, there have been other missteps along the way. There are limits in the support that can be given because of the devolved financial uh, arrangements. So it doesn't only come down uh, to trust. But let me just give you one example because I want to come on. I, I, I want to mention the issue of teaching because I think it's absolutely critical. See, the failures, I think, that happened at the end of the first lockdown, many people have pointed out there's a failure to have a decent test and trace system. That's probably the biggest failure. But there's another failure, which is equally ideological. And that was the laissez-faire attitude of the government, which said to every sector, you make things safe and we just hand over responsibility to you. So to employers, you make the workplace safe. We're not going to uh, regulate it. We're not going to enforce it. We'll just trust you. Um, hospitality, the same, and schools, the same. Teachers were told, head teachers were told to make their schools safe, but how the hell do you do that when you don't have any more resources? And had there been more support, again, not blame support, support, for instance, in paying for spaces and teachers so you could have distance classrooms, uh, paying for decent ventilation, paying so all students can have masks because lots of kids can't afford masks. If you did that, I think get going away from that laissez-faire to more supported regulation, you would lead, need less limitation. So the devolved administrations have been able to do some things at the ideological level, but trust is also a matter of practicality and supporting people. And so the limits, I think, come down to the devolved arrangements and the, the limits on their ability to give support when that support is not being given by the UK government. Anne, you're uh, an advisor to, uh, to the Welsh government. How effective has the Welsh approach been? <laughs> I guess I'd reiterate that. So I think often um, the example that's used is Scotland, but I think levels of trust in Welsh government are much higher as well. And I think there have been um, real, there's, there has been real communication. I think uh, our government, you know, if, 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 you, if you talk about highly emotive issues at the moment like free school meals which really fundamentally come back down to support measures for people you know wales and scotland were right there 
Wales straight away that we would support our young children in being able to eat during the holidays. And so it's a, so I think there have been differences. I think it I think consistent messaging really supports the things we want to achieve as you know four nations and working together is the thing that is really important but you know there will be places there will be areas where we diverge and some of those will be due to what's the different natures of the different regions thank you Anthony, um, a question for you. Um, if there could be one change to the financial support that's provided that would help compliance, what should that be? Um, more generous sick pay. As simple as that. Yeah. And is that does that explain the huge difference between um, compliance rates when in self isolation in the UK compared to say somewhere like New York that I think is you know on ninety percent plus levels of compliance at the moment? I couldn't say, but I mean, it seems really clear to me that you need to give people an incentive to self-isolate if they're told to. Um, it, it's very costly for people to do that. Thank you. Does anybody else want to come in on um, on the financial side? Well, I can tell you about New York um, uh, because one of one of my colleagues on the on the Scottish um, advisory group was uh, uh, Devi Sridhar, who is wonderful, um, was uh, in, involved in in the mayor's uh, group, and she was talking about this, and it's fascinating. So, I mean, in New York, you're right, between 95 and 98 percent, because uh, number one, you get pay. Number two, you get a, a, a hotel accommodation. Number three, you get support with food and other necessities. Number four, you get people uh, checking you're OK, the emotional needs as well. Um, so we should stop talking about self-isolation. Self-isolation will never work, but and start talking about supported isolation. Um, and that might have a chance. Thank you. And then one final question. I knew this would come up on Christmas. Um, is there a safe way to have Christmas or once you provide a temporary relaxation, is that it? Tony. Uh, th there was a fun idea on Twitter today, I think it was, that we should postpone Christmas to the summer. So I, I would support that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Are we going to have Christmas this year? Should we? I, can I, say, I mean, there are many complexities about Christmas and of course you can't give any absolute guarantee because if the NHS is about to collapse, um, w w you know, we, we cannot put up with bodies in, in the streets, so you can't give an absolute guarantee. However, personally, I think, again, and it comes back to my point that if there was more regulation would lead, need less limitation. If we pivoted towards supported regulation and part of that, the quid pro quo was, the government and employers and owners can do that in the public domain, but it's contingent upon us in the domestic domain also to regulate spaces. There's been no emphasis on how important it is, for instance, to have ventilation, distance and hygiene at home as well as elsewhere. And I think if the again, if the government does its bit, if it supports us in all those other domains, it's in a far better position to ask people to act safely at home. And if people act safely at home, then it's safer to allow other people into the home. So I think we need to a pivot towards that partnership approach and a partnership approach in which we give clear information to people about how to regulate the domestic sphere, because that's the great missing piece in everything that's been done. And as we know, it's one of the major areas where transmission happens. And that needs to be done generally. There are debates about exactly what you do about Christmas, but it's got to fit in a brought into a broader understanding of how to address domestic behaviour and to engage people to act responsibly and safely within the home as well as outside. Thank you, Chris. One of the I'd agree with that entirely, uh, but I think one of the things that we have to think about at this stage is also about um, the conventional lead in time for families at Christmas. So the moments at which the decision process for actually gathering a family for Christmas is not a short process. When I'm Roman Catholic, so it's quite extreme. There are large numbers of us, but the the um, uh, whatever they do, they have to start making decisions now. Ideally, they should have started several months ago, but now we'll, we'll do. Um, 
even if again it's on a sort of contingent basis that the, the answer will actually be there'll be a sort of rule of six thing um so long as the following conditions are met that's fine we're adults we can deal with this like talk to us like we're adults and let us plan and then we can all sit there and watch you know the our local hospitals numbers come in and work out what's gonna what's gonna apply to us thank you and finally Anne any final words um before we draw this to a close well I guess it's all come back to that fundamental thing isn't it is is to communicate clearly to accept that people are able to understand the complexity and uncertainty but they need to plan early and we also we need to accept that that the drivers for for christmas will be huge and they need to be addressed and we need to do it early enough that people can plan Thank you. OK, we're now at 2 p.m., so I'm going to have to draw this to a close. Sorry to um, audience members who submitted many questions uh, that we didn't get around to discussing. Uh, hopefully we'll uh, get a second chance at some point. Thank you to the panel for a brilliant discussion. I uh, very much hope that those tasked with making decisions about what next are listening in and can use lots of these ideas. Uh, there'll be a video of this event available on our website as soon as possible. Um, so thank you very much to our panellists um, and thank you to you, the audience, for tuning in. Um, stay safe. Thank you very much. <laughs>